Section twenty of A Lear of the Steps, etc., by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Asia, Part Three. Next morning, I was awake but had not yet begun to get up. I heard the tap of a stick on my window, and a voice I knew at once for Gagin's hummed, "Art thou asleep?" with the guitar will i awaken thee i made haste to open the door to him good morning said gagin coming in i'm disturbing you rather early but only see what a morning it is fresh dewy larks singing with his curly shining hair his open neck and rosy cheeks he was fresh as the morning himself i dressed we went out into the garden sat down on a bench ordered coffee and proceeded to talk. Gagin told me his plans for the future. He possessed a moderate fortune, was not dependent on any one, and wanted to devote himself to painting. He only regretted that he had not had more sense sooner, but had wasted so much time doing nothing. I too referred to my projects, and incidentally confided to him the secret of my unhappy love. He listened to me amiably, but so far as I could observe, I did not arouse in him any very strong sympathy with my passion. Sighing once or twice after me, for civility's sake, Gagin suggested that I should go home with him and look at his sketches. I agreed at once. We did not find Asya. She had, the landlady told us, gone to the ruin. A mile and a half from L were the remains of a feudal castle. Gagin showed me all his canvases. In his sketches there was a good deal of life and truth, a certain breadth and freedom. But not one of them was finished, and the drawing struck me as careless and incorrect. I gave candid expression to my opinion. "'Yes, yes,' he assented with a sigh. "'You're right. It's all very poor and crude. What's to be done? I haven't had the training I ought to have had. Besides, one's cursed Slavonic slackness gets the better of one. While one dreams of work, one soars away in eagle flight. One fancies one's going to shake the earth out of its place. But when it comes to doing anything, one's weak and weary directly. I began trying to cheer him up, but he waved me off, and bundling his sketches up together, threw them on the sofa. If I've patience, something may be made of me, he muttered. If I haven't, I shall remain a half-baked noble amateur. Come, we'd better be looking for Asya. We went out. Part Four. The road to the ruin went twisting down the steep incline into a narrow wooded valley. At the bottom ran a stream, noisily threading its way through the pebbles, as though in haste to flow into the great river, peacefully shining beyond the dark ridge of the deep indented mountain crest. Gagin called my attention to some places where the light fell specially finely. One could see in his words that, even if not a painter, he was undoubtedly an artist. The ruin soon came into sight. On the very summit of the naked rock rose a square tower, black all over, still strong, but, as it were, cleft in two by a longitudinal crack. Mossy walls adjoined the tower. Here and there ivy clung about it. Wind-twisted bushes hung down from the grey battlements and crumbling arches. A stray path led up to the gates, still standing entire. We had just reached them, when suddenly a girl's figure darted up in front of us, ran swiftly over a heap of debris, and stood on the projecting part of the wall right over the precipice. "'Why, it's Asya! cried Gagin. "'The mad thing!' We went through the gates and found ourselves in a small courtyard, half overgrown with crab-apple trees and nettles. On the projecting ledge Asya was actually sitting. She turned and faced us, laughing, but did not move. Gagin shook his finger at her, while I loudly reproached her for her recklessness. "'That's enough,' Gagin said to me in a whisper. "'Don't tease her. You don't know what she is. She'd very likely climb right up onto the tower. Look!' you'd better be admiring the intelligence of the people of these parts." I looked round. In a corner, ensconced in a tiny wooden hut, an old woman was knitting a stocking, and looking at us through her spectacles. She sold beer, gingerbread, and seltzer water to tourists. 
We seated ourselves on a bench and began drinking some fairly cold beer out of heavy pewter pots. Asya still sat without moving, with her feet tucked under her and a muslin scarf wrapped round her head. Her graceful figure stood out distinctly and finely against the clear sky, but I looked at her with a feeling of hostility. The evening before I had detected something forced, something not quite natural about her. She's trying to impress us, I thought. Whatever for? What a childish trick! As though guessing my thoughts, she suddenly turned a rapid, searching glance upon me, laughed again, leaped in two bounds from the wall, and going up to the old woman, asked her for a glass of water. "'Do you think I am thirsty?' she said, addressing her brother. "'No, there are some flowers on the walls, which must be watered.' Gagin made her no reply and with the glass in her hand she began scrambling over the ruins, now and then stopping, bending down, and with comic solemnity pouring a few drops of water which sparkled brightly in the sun. Her movements were very charming, but I felt, as before, angry with her, even while I could not help admiring her lightness and agility. At one dangerous place she purposely screamed, and then laughed, I felt still more annoyed with her. "'Why, she climbs like a goat,' the old woman mumbled, turning for an instant from her stocking. At last Asya had emptied the glass, and with a saucy swing she walked back to us. A queer smile was faintly twitching at her eyebrows, nostrils, and lips. Her dark eyes were screwed up with a half-insolent, half-merry look. "'You consider my behaviour improper,' her face seemed to say. "'All the same, I know you're admiring me.' "'Well done, Asya, well done,' Gagin said in a low voice. She seemed all at once overcome with shame. She dropped her long eyelashes, and sat down beside us with a guilty air. At that moment I got for the first time a good look at her face, the most changeable face I had ever seen. A few instants later it had turned quite pale, and wore an intense, almost mournful expression, its very features seemed larger, sterner, simpler. She completely subsided. We walked round the ruins, Asya followed us, and admired the views. Meanwhile it was getting near dinner-time. As he paid the old woman, Gagin asked for another mug of beer, and, turning to me, cried with a sly face, "'To the health of the lady of your heart!' "'Why, has he? Have you such a lady?' Asya asked suddenly. "'Why, who hasn't?' retorted Gagin. Asya seemed pensive for an instant. Then her face changed. The challenging, almost insolent smile came back once more. On the way home she kept laughing, and was more mischievous again. She broke off a long branch, put it on her shoulder, like a gun, and tied her scarf round her head. I remember we met a numerous family of light-haired affected English people. They all, as though at a word of command, looked Asya up and down with their glassy eyes in chilly amazement, while she started singing aloud, as though in defiance of them. When she reached home she went straight to her own room, and only appeared when dinner was on the table. She was dressed in her best clothes, had carefully arranged her hair, laced herself in at the waist, and put on gloves. At dinner she behaved very decorously, almost affectedly hardly tasting anything, and drinking water out of a wine-glass. She obviously wanted to show herself in a new character before me, the character of a well-bred, refined young lady. Gagin did not check her. One could see that it was his habit to humour her in everything. He merely glanced at me good-naturedly now and then, and slightly shrugged his shoulders, as though he would say, "'She's a baby. Don't be hard on her.' Directly dinner was over, Asya got up, made us a curtsy, and, putting on her hat, asked Gagin if she might go to see Frau Louise. "'Since when do you ask leave?' he answered, with his invariable smile, a rather embarrassed smile this time. "'Are you bored with us?' "'No, but I promised Frau Louise yesterday to go and see her. Besides, I thought you would like better being alone. Mr. N.' she indicated me will tell you something more about himself." She went out. "'Frau Louise,' Gagin began, 
trying to avoid meeting my eyes, is the widow of a former burgomaster here, a good-natured, but silly old woman. She has taken a great fancy to Asya. Asya has a passion for making friends with people of a lower class. I've noticed it's always pride that's at the root of that. She's pretty well spoiled with me, as you see," he went on after a brief pause. But what would you have me do? I can't be exacting with any one, and with her less than any one else. I am bound not to be hard on her." I was silent. Gagin changed the conversation. The more I saw of him, the more strongly was I attracted by him. I soon understood him. His was a typically Russian nature, truthful, honest, simple but unhappily, without energy, lacking tenacity and inward fire. Youth was not boiling over within him, but shone with a subdued light. He was very sweet and clever, but I could not picture to myself what he would become in ripe manhood. An artist, without intense, incessant toil, there is no being an artist. And as for toil, I mused, watching his soft features, listening to his slow, deliberate talk, no, you'll never toil. You don't know how to put pressure on yourself. But not to love him was an impossibility. One's heart was simply drawn to him. We spent four hours together, sometimes sitting on the sofa, sometimes walking slowly up and down before the house, and in those four hours we became intimate friends. The sun was setting, and it was time for me to go home. Asya had not yet come back. What a reckless thing she is," said Gagin. Shall I come along with you? We'll turn in at Frau Luise's on the way. I'll ask whether she's there. It's not far out of the way." We went down into the town, and turning off into a narrow, crooked little by-street, stopped before a house four stories high, and with two windows abreast in each story. The second story projected beyond the first, the third and fourth stood out still further than the second. The whole house, with its crumbling carving, its two stout columns below, its pointed brick roof, and the projecting piece on the attic, poking out like a beak, looked like a huge crouching bird. "'Asya!' shouted Gagin. "'Are you here?' A window with a light in it in the third story rattled and opened, and we saw Asya's dark head. Behind her peered out the toothless and dim-sighted face of an old German woman. I'm here," said Asya, leaning roguishly out with her elbows on the window-sill. I'm quite contented here. Hello there! Catch!" she added, flinging Gagin a twig of geranium. Imagine I'm the lady of your heart. Frau Luise laughed. N is going," said Gagin. He wants to say good-bye to you. Really? said Asya. In that case give him my geranium, and I'll come back directly. She slammed down the window, and seemed to be kissing Frau Luise. Gagin offered me the twig without a word. I put it in my pocket in silence, went on to the ferry, and crossed over to the other side of the river. I remember I went home thinking of nothing in particular, but with a strange load at my heart, when I was suddenly struck by a strong familiar scent, rare in Germany. I stood still, and saw near the road a small bed of hemp. Its fragrance of the steppes instantaneously brought my own country to my mind, and stirred a passionate longing for it in my heart. I longed to breathe Russian air, to tread on Russian soil. What am I doing here? Why am I trailing about in foreign countries among strangers? I cried, and the dead weight I had felt at my heart suddenly passed into a bitter, stinging emotion. I reached home in quite a different frame of mind from the evening before. I felt almost enraged, and it was a long while before I could recover my equanimity. I was beset by a feeling of anger I could not explain. At last I sat down, and bethinking myself of my faithless widow I wound up every day regularly by dreaming, as in duty bound, of this lady I pulled out one of her letters. But I did not even open it. My thoughts promptly took another turn. I began dreaming dreaming of Asya. I recollected that Gagin had, in the course of conversation, hinted at certain difficulties, obstacles in the way of his returning to Russia. "'Come, is she his sister?' I said aloud. 
I undressed, got into bed, and tried to get to sleep. But an hour later I was sitting up again in bed, propped up with my elbow on the pillow, and was once more thinking about this whimsical chit of a girl with the affected laugh. She's the figure of the little Galatea of Raphael in Zifarnicina, I murmured. Yes, and she's not his sister. The widow's letter lay tranquil and undisturbed on the floor, a white patch in the moonlight. End of section 20section twenty one of a lear of the steps etc by ivan turgenev this librivox recording is in the public domain asia part five next morning i went again to l i persuaded myself i wanted to see gagin but secretly i was tempted to go and see what asia would do whether she would be as whimsical as on the previous day i found them both in their sitting-room and strange to say possibly because i had been thinking so much that night and morning of russia asia struck me as a typically russian girl and a girl of the humbler class almost like a russian servant girl she wore an old gown she had combed her hair back behind her ears and was sitting still as a mouse at the window working at some embroidery in a frame quietly demurely as though she had never done anything else in all her life she said scarcely anything looked quietly at her work and her features wore such an ordinary commonplace expression that i could not help thinking of our katyas and mashas at home in russia to complete the resemblance she started singing in a low voice little mother little dove i looked at her little face which was rather yellow and listless i thought of my dreams of the previous night and i felt a pang of regret for something it was exquisite weather. Gagin announced that he was going to make a sketch today from nature. I asked him if he would let me go with him, whether I shouldn't be in his way. On the contrary, he assured me, you may give me some good advice. He put on a hat, a la Van Dyke, and a blouse, took a canvas under his arm, and set out. I sauntered after him. Asia stayed at home. Gagin, as he went out, asked her to see that the soup wasn't too thin. Asia promised to look into the kitchen. Gagin went as far as the valley I knew already, sat down on a stone, and began to sketch a hollow oak with spreading branches. I lay on the grass and took out a book, but I didn't read two pages, and he simply spoiled a sheet of paper. We did little else but talk, and as far as I am competent to judge, we talked rather cleverly and subtly of the right method of working, of what we must avoid, and what one must cling to, wherein lay the significance of the artist in our age. Gagin, at last, decided that he was not in the mood to-day, and lay down beside me on the grass. And then our youthful eloquence flowed freely. Fervent, pensive, enthusiastic by turns, but consisting almost always of those vague generalities into which a Russian is so ready to expand. When we had talked to our heart's content, and were full of a feeling of satisfaction, as though we had got something done, achieved some sort of success, we returned home. I found Asia just as I had left her. However assiduously I watched her, I could not detect a shade of coquetry, not a sign of an intentionally assumed role in her this time it was impossible to reproach her for artificiality. "'Aha!' said Gagin. "'She has imposed fasting and penance on herself.' Towards evening she yawned several times with obvious genuineness, and went early to her room. I myself soon said good-bye to Gagin, and as I went home I had no dreams of any kind. That day was spent in sober sensations. I remember, however, as I lay down to sleep, I involuntarily exclaimed aloud, "'What a chameleon the girl is!' And after a moment's thought I added, "'Anyway, she's not his sister.'" Part six. A whole fortnight passed by. I visited the Gagans every day. Asia seemed to avoid me, but she did not permit herself one of the mischievous tricks which had so surprised me the first two days of our acquaintance. She seemed secretly wounded or embarrassed. She even laughed less than at first. I watched her with curiosity. 
she spoke french and german fairly well but one could easily see in everything she did that she had not from childhood been brought up under a woman's care and that she had had a curious irregular education that had nothing in common with gagin's bringing up he was in spite of the van dyke hat and the blouse so thoroughly every inch of him the soft half effeminate great russian nobleman while she was not like the young girl of the same class in all her movements there was a certain restlessness the wild stock had not long been grafted the new wine was still fermenting by nature modest and timid she was exasperated by her own shyness and in her exasperation tried to force herself to be bold and free and easy in which she was not always successful i sometimes began to talk to her about her life in russia about her past she answered my questions reluctantly i found out however that before going abroad she had lived a long while in the country i came upon her once intent on a book alone with her head on her hands and her fingers thrust into her hair she was eagerly devouring the lines bravo i said going up to her how studious you are she raised her head and looked gravely and severely at me you think i can do nothing but laugh she said and was about to go away i glanced at the title of the book it was some french novel i can't commend your choice though i observed what am i to read then she cried and flinging the book on the table she added so i'd better go and play the fool and ran out into the garden that same day in the evening i was reading gagin hermann und dorothea Asia at first kept fidgeting about us then all at once she stopped listened softly sat down by me and heard the reading through to the end the next day i hardly knew her again till i guessed it had suddenly occurred to her to be as domestic and discreet as dorothea in fact i saw her as a half enigmatic creature vain self-conscious to the last degree she attracted me even when i was irritated by her of one thing only I felt more and more convinced, and that was that she was not Gagin's sister. His manner with her was not like a brother's, it was too affectionate, too considerate, and at the same time a little constrained. A curious incident apparently confirmed my suspicions. One evening when I reached the vineyard where the Gagins lived, I found the gate fastened. Without losing much time in deliberation, I made my way to a broken-down place I had noticed before in the hedge and jumped over it. Not far from this spot there was a little arbour of acacias on one side of the path. I got up to it and was just about to pass it. Suddenly I was struck by Asya's voice passionately and tearfully uttering the following words. "'No, I'll love no one but you. No, no, I will love you only, for ever.' come asya calm yourself said gagin you know i believe you their voices came from the arbour i could see them both through the thin network of leaves they did not notice me you you only she repeated and she flung herself on his neck and with broken sobs began kissing him and clinging to his breast come come he repeated lightly passing his hand over her hair for a few instants I stood motionless. Suddenly I started. Should I go up to them? On no consideration flashed through my head. With rapid footsteps I turned back to the hedge, leaped over it into the road, and almost running went home. I smiled, rubbed my hands, wondered at the chance which had so suddenly confirmed my surmises. I did not for one instant doubt their accuracy and yet there was a great bitterness in my heart. What accomplished hypocrites they are, though, I thought. And what for? Why should he try to take me in? I shouldn't have expected it of him, and what a touching scene of reconciliation! End of section 21「Section 22 of A Lear of the Steps, etc. by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Asya, Part 7 
I slept badly, and next morning got up early, fastened a knapsack on my back, and telling my landlady not to expect me back for the night, set off walking to the mountains, along the upper part of the stream on which Z is situated. These mountains, offsets of the ridge known as the Hunsrück, are very interesting from a geological point of view. They are especially remarkable for the purity and regularity of the strata of basalt. But I was in no mood for geological observations. I did not take stock of what was passing within me. One feeling was clear to me, a disinclination to see the Gagans. I assured myself that the sole reason of my sudden distaste for their society was anger at their duplicity. Who forced them to pass themselves off as brother and sister? However, I tried not to think about them. I sauntered in leisurely fashion about the mountains and valleys, sat in the village inns, talking peacefully to the innkeepers and people drinking in them, or lay on a flat stone warmed by the sun, and watched the clouds floating by. Luckily it was exquisite weather. In such pursuits I passed three days, and not without pleasure, though my heart did ache at times. My own mood was in perfect harmony with the peaceful nature of that quiet countryside. I gave myself up entirely to the play of circumstances, of fleeting impressions. In slow succession they flowed through my soul, and left on it at last one general sensation, in which all I had seen, felt and heard in those three days, was mingled, all. The delicate fragrance of resin in the forest, the call and tap of the woodpeckers, the never-ceasing chatter of the clear brooks, with spotted trout lying in the sand at the bottom, the somewhat softened outlines of the mountains, the surly rocks, the little clean villages, with respectable old churches and trees, the storks in the meadows, the neat mills with swiftly turning wheels, the beaming faces of the villagers, their blue smocks and grey stockings, the creaking, deliberately moving wagons, drawn by sleek horses and sometimes cows, the long-haired young men, wandering on the clean roads, planted with apple and pear trees. Even now I like to recall my impressions of those days. Good luck go with thee, modest nook of Germany, with thy simple plenty, with traces everywhere of busy hands, of patient though leisurely toil. Good luck, and peace to thee. I came home at the end of the third day. I forgot to say that in my anger with the Gagans I tried to revive the image of my cruel-hearted widow, but my efforts were fruitless. I remember when I applied myself to musing upon her, I saw a little peasant girl of five years old, with a round little face and innocently staring eyes. She gazed with such childish directness at me. I felt ashamed before her innocent stare, I could not lie in her presence, and at once, and once for all, said a last good-bye to my former flame. At home I found a note from Gagin. He wondered at the suddenness of my plan, reproached me, asked why I had not taken him with me, and pressed me to go and see him directly I was back. I read this note with dissatisfaction, but the next day I set off to the Gagins. Part Eight. Gagin met me in friendly fashion, and overwhelmed me with affectionate reproaches, but Asya, as though intentionally, burst out laughing for no reason whatever directly she saw me, and promptly ran away, as she so often did. Gagin was disconcerted. He muttered after her that she must be crazy, and begged me to excuse her. I confess I was very much annoyed with Asya. Already, apart from that, I was not at my ease, and now again this unnatural laughter, these strange grimaces. I pretended, however, not to notice anything, and began telling Gagin some of the incidents of my short tour. He told me what he had been doing in my absence. But our talk did not flow easily. Asya came into the room and ran out again. I declared at last that I had urgent work to do, and must get back home. Gagin at first tried to keep me, then, looking intently at me, offered to see me on my way. In the passage Asya suddenly came up to me and held out her hand. I shook her fingers very slightly and barely bowed to her. Gagin and I crossed the Rhine together, and when we reached my favourite ash-tree with the statuette of the Madonna, 
we sat down on the bench to admire the view. A remarkable conversation took place between us. At first we exchanged a few words, then we were silent, watching the clear river. "'Tell me,' began Gagin all at once, with his habitual smile, "'what do you think of Asia? I suppose she must strike you as rather strange, doesn't she?' Yes, I answered, in some perplexity. I had not expected he would begin to speak of her. One has to know her well to judge her, he observed. She has a very good heart, but she's willful. She's difficult to get on with, but you couldn't blame her if you knew her story. Her story? I broke in. Why, isn't she your... Gagin glanced at me. Do you really think she isn't my sister? No, he went on, paying no attention to my confusion, she really is my sister. She's my father's daughter. Let me tell you about her. I feel I can trust you, and I'll tell you all about it. My father was very kind, clever, cultivated, and unhappy. Fate treated him no worse than others, but he could not get over her first blow. He married early, for love. His wife, my mother, died very soon after. I was only six months old then. My father took me away with him to his country place, and for twelve years he never went out anywhere. He looked after my education himself, and would never have parted with me if his brother, my uncle, had not come to see us in the country. This uncle always lived in Petersburg, where he held a very important post. He persuaded my father to put me in his charge, as my father would not on any consideration agree to leave the country. My uncle represented to him that it was bad for a boy of my age to live in complete solitude, that with such a constantly depressed and taciturn instructor as my father I should infallibly be much behind other boys of my age in education, and that my character might even possibly suffer. My father resisted his brother's counsels a long while, but he gave way at last. I cried at parting from my father. I loved him, though I had never seen a smile on his face. But when I got to Petersburg, I soon forgot our dark and cheerless home. I entered a cadet school, and from school passed on into a regiment of the guards. Every year I used to go home to the country for a few weeks, and every year I found my father more and more low-spirited, absorbed in himself, depressed, and even timorous. He used to go to church every day, and had quite got out of the way of talking. On one of my visits, I was about twenty then, I saw for the first time in our house a thin, dark-eyed little girl of ten years old, Asya. My father told me she was an orphan whom he had kept out of charity. That was his very expression. I paid no particular attention to her. She was shy, quick in her movements, and silent as a little wild animal, and directly I went into my father's favourite room, an immense gloomy apartment where my mother had died, and where candles were kept burning even in the daytime, she would hide at once behind his big armchair or behind the bookcase. It so happened that for three or four years after that visit the duties of the service prevented my going home to the country. I used to get a short letter from my father every month. Asya he rarely mentioned, and only incidentally. He was over fifty, but he seemed still young. Imagine my horror all of a sudden, suspecting nothing. I received a letter from the steward in which he informed me my father was dangerously ill and begged me to come as soon as possible if I wanted to take leave of him. I galloped off post-haste, and found my father still alive, but almost at his last gasp. He was greatly relieved to see me, clasped me in his wasted arms, and gazed at me with a long, half-scrutinizing, half-imploring look, and making me promise I would carry out his last request, he told his old valet to bring Asya. The old man brought her in. She could scarcely stand upright, and was shaking all over. "'Here,' said my father, with an effort, "'I confide to you my daughter, your sister. You will hear all about her from Yakov,' he added, pointing to the valet. Asya sobbed, and fell with her face on the bed. Half an hour later my father died. This was what I learned. 
Asia was the daughter of my father by a former maid-servant of my mother's, Tatyana. I have a vivid recollection of this Tatyana. I remember her tall, slender figure, her handsome, stern, clever face, with big dark eyes. She had the character of being a proud, unapproachable girl. As far as I could find out from Yakov's respectful, unfinished sentences, my father had become attached to her some years after my mother's death. Tatyana was not living then in my father's house, but in the hut of a married sister, who had charge of the cows. My father became exceedingly fond of her, and after my departure from the country he even wanted to marry her, but she herself would not consent to be his wife, in spite of his entreaties. The deceased Tatyana Vasilyevna, Yakov informed me, standing in the doorway with his hands behind him, had good sense in everything and she didn't want to do harm to your father. A poor wife I should be for you, a poor sort of lady I should make, she so was pleased to say. She said so before me. Tatyana would not even move into the house, and went on living at her sister's with Asya. In my childhood I used to see Tatyana only on saints' days in church. With her head tied up in a dark kerchief, and a yellow shawl on her shoulders, she used to stand in the crowd near a window, her stern profile used to stand out sharply against a transparent window-pane, and she used to pray sedately and gravely, bowing low to the ground in the old-fashioned way. When my uncle carried me off, Asya was only two years old, and she lost her mother when she was nine. Directly Tatyana died, my father took Asya into the house. He had before then expressed a wish to have her with him, but that too Tatyana had refused him. Imagine what must have passed in Asya's mind when she was taken into the master's house. To this day she cannot forget the moment when they first put her in a silk dress and kissed her hand. Her mother, as long as she lived, had brought her up very strictly. With my father she enjoyed absolute freedom. He was her tutor. She saw no one except him. He did not spoil her, that is to say, he didn't fondle and pet her, but he loved her passionately, and never checked her in anything. In his heart he considered he had wronged her. Asya soon realized that she was the chief personage in the house. She knew the master was her father, but just as quickly she was aware of her false position. Self-consciousness was strongly developed in her, mistrustfulness too. Bad habits took root simplicity was lost. She wanted, she confessed this to me once herself, to force the whole world to forget her origin. She was ashamed of her mother, and at the same time ashamed of being ashamed, and was proud of her too. You see she knew and knows a lot that she oughtn't to have known at her age. But was it her fault? The forces of youth were at work in her, her heart was in a ferment, and not a guiding hand near her absolute independence in everything. And wasn't it hard for her to put up with? She wanted to be as good as other young ladies. She flew to books. But what good could she get from that? Her life went on as irregularly as it had begun, but her heart was not spoiled, her intellect was uninjured. And there was I, a boy of twenty, with a girl of thirteen on my hands. For the first few days after my father's death, the very sound of my voice threw her into a fever. My caresses caused her anguish, and it was only slowly and gradually that she got used to me. It is true that later, when she fully realized that I really did acknowledge her as my sister, and cared for her, she became passionately attached to me. She can feel nothing by halves. I took her to Petersburg. Painful as it was to part with her, we could not live together. I sent her to one of the best boarding-schools. Asya knew our separation was inevitable, yet she began by fretting herself ill over it, and almost died. Later on she plucked up more spirit, and spent four years at school. But contrary to my expectations, she was almost exactly the same as before. The headmistress of the school often made complaints of her. "'And we can't punish her,' she used to say to me and she's not amenable to kindness. Asya was exceedingly quick-witted, and did better at her lessons than anyone, but she never would put herself on a level with the rest. 
she was perverse, and held herself aloof. I could not blame her very much for it. In her position she had either to be subservient, or to hold herself aloof. Of all the schoolfellows she only made friends with one, an ugly girl of poor family, who was spat upon by the rest. The other girls with whom she was brought up, mostly of good family, did not like her, teased her and taunted her as far as they could. Asia would not give way to them an inch. One day at their lesson on the law of God the teacher was talking of the vices. "'Servility and cowardice are the worst vices,' Asia said aloud. She would still go her own way, in fact. Only her manners were improved, though even in that respect I think she did not gain a great deal. At last she reached her seventeenth year. I could not keep her any longer at school. I found myself in a rather serious difficulty. Suddenly a blessed idea came to me, to resign my commission and go abroad for a year or two, taking Asia with me. No sooner thought than done, and here we are on the banks of the Rhine, where I am trying to take up painting, and she is as naughty and troublesome as ever. But now I hope you will not judge her too harshly, for though she pretends she doesn't care, she values the good opinion of every one, and yours particularly." And Gagin smiled again his gentle smile. I pressed his hand warmly. "'That's how it is,' Gagin began again. "'But I have a trying time with her. She's like gunpowder, always ready to go off. So far she has never taken a fancy to any one, but woe betide us if she falls in love. I sometimes don't know what to do with her. The other day she took some notion into her head, and suddenly began declaring I was colder to her than I used to be, that she loved me and no one else, and never would love any one else, and she cried so as she said it. So that was it, I was beginning, but I bit my tongue. Tell me, I questioned Gagin, we have talked so frankly about everything, is it possible, really, she has never cared for any one yet? Didn't she see any young men in Petersburg? She didn't like them at all. No, Asia wants a hero, an exceptional individual, or a picturesque shepherd on a mountain pass. But I've been chattering away, and keeping you," he added, getting up. "'Do you know,' I began, "'let's go back to your place. I don't want to go home.' "'What about your work?' I made no reply. Gagin smiled good-humouredly, and we went back to L. As I caught sight of the familiar vineyard and little white house, I felt a certain sweetness, yes, sweetness in my heart, as though honey was stealthily dropping thence for me. My heart was light after what Gagin had told me. End of section 22「Asia met us in the very doorway of the house. I expected a laugh again, but she came to meet us, pale and silent, with downcast eyes. "'Here he is again,' Gagin began, and he wanted to come back of his own accord, observe. Asia looked at me inquiringly. It was my turn now to hold out my hand, and this time I pressed her chilly fingers warmly. I felt very sorry for her. I understood now a great deal in her that had puzzled me before, her inward restlessness, her want of breeding, her desire to be striking, all became clear to me. I had had a peep into that soul, a secret scourge was always tormenting her, her ignorant self-consciousness struggled in confused alarm, but her whole nature strove towards truth. I understood why this strange little girl attracted me. It was not only by the half-wild charm of her slender body that she attracted me. I liked her soul. Gagin began rummaging among his canvases. I suggested to Asya that she should take a turn with me in the vineyard. She agreed at once, with cheerful and almost humble readiness. We went halfway down the mountain, and sat down on a broad stone. "'And you weren't dull without us?' Asya began. "'And were you dull without me?' I queried. Asya gave me a sidelong look. "'Yes,' she answered. 
was it nice in the mountains she went on at once were they high ones higher than the clouds tell me what you saw you were telling my brother but i didn't hear anything it was of your own accord you went away i remarked i went away because i'm not going away now she added with a confiding caress in her voice you were angry to-day i yes you upon my word whatever for i don't know but you were angry and you went away angry i was very much vexed that you went away like that and i'm so glad you came back and i'm glad i came back i observed Acia gave herself a little shrug as children often do when they are very pleased oh i'm good at guessing she went on sometimes simply from the way papa coughed i could tell in the next room whether he was pleased with me or not till that day Acia had never once spoken to me of her father i was struck by it were you fond of your father i said and suddenly to my intense annoyance i felt i was reddening she made no answer and blushed too we were both silent in the distance a smoking steamer was scudding along on the rhine we began watching it why don't you tell me about your tour Acia murmured why did you laugh to-day directly you saw me i asked i don't know really sometimes i want to cry but i laugh you mustn't judge me by what i do oh by the by what a story that is about the lorelei is that her rock we can see they say she used to drown every one but as soon as she fell in love she threw herself in the water i like that story frau luise tells me all sorts of stories frau luise has a black cat with yellow eyes Acia raised her head and shook her curls ah i am happy she said at that instant there floated across to us broken monotonous sounds hundreds of voices in unison and at regular intervals were repeating a chanted litany the crowd of pilgrims moved slowly along the road below with crosses and banners i should like to go with them said Acia, listening to the sounds of the voices gradually growing fainter are you so religious i should like to go away on a pilgrimage on some great exploit she went on as it is the days pass by life passes by and what have we done you are ambitious i observed you want to live to some purpose to leave some trace behind you is that impossible then impossible i was on the point of repeating but i glanced at her bright eyes and only said you can try tell me began Acia after a brief silence during which shadows passed over her face which had already turned pale did you care much for that lady you remember my brother drank her health at the ruins the day after we first knew you i laughed your brother was joking i never cared for any lady at any rate i don't care for one now and what do you like in women she asked throwing back her head with innocent curiosity what a strange question i cried Acia was a little disconcerted i ought not to ask you such a question ought i forgive me i'm used to chattering away about anything that comes into my head that's why i am afraid to speak speak for god's sake don't be afraid i hastened to intervene i'm so glad you're leaving off being shy at last Acia looked down and laughed a soft light-hearted laugh i had never heard such a laugh from her well tell me about something she went on stroking out the skirt of her dress and arranging the folds over her legs as though she were settling herself for a long while tell me or read me something just as you read us do you remember from onegin she suddenly grew pensive where now is the cross and the branches shade over my poor mother's grave she murmured in a low voice that's not as it is in pushkin i observed but i should like to have been tatyana she went on in the same dreamy tone tell me a story she suddenly added eagerly but i was not in a mood for telling stories i was watching her all bathed in the bright sunshine all peace and gentleness 
everything was joyously radiant about us, below and above us, sky, earth and waters. The very air seemed saturated with brilliant light. "'Look, how beautiful!' I said, unconsciously sinking my voice. "'Yes, it is beautiful,' she answered just as softly, not looking at me. "'If only you and I were birds, how we would soar, how we would fly! We'd simply plunge into that blue. But we're not birds.' "'But we may grow wings,' I rejoined. "'How so?' "'Live a little longer, and you'll find out. There are feelings that lift us above the earth. Don't trouble yourself. You will have wings.' "'Have you had them?' how shall i say i think up till now i have never taken flight Asia grew pensive once more i bent a little towards her can you waltz she asked me suddenly yes i answered rather puzzled well come along then come along i'll ask my brother to play us a waltz we'll fancy we are flying that our wings have grown she ran into the house i ran after her and in a few minutes we were turning round and round the narrow little room to the sweet strains of Laner. Asia waltzed splendidly, with enthusiasm. Something soft and womanly suddenly peeped through the childish severity of her profile. Long after my arm kept the feeling of the contact of her soft waist, long after I heard her quickened breathing close to my ear, long after I was haunted by dark, immobile, almost closed eyes in a pale but eager face framed in by fluttering curls part ten all that day passed most delightfully we were as merry as children Asia was very sweet and simple gagin was delighted as he watched her i went home late when i got out into the middle of the rhine i asked the ferryman to let the boat float down with the current the old man pulled up his oars, and the majestic river bore us along. As I looked about me, listened, brooded over recollections, I was suddenly aware of a secret restlessness astir in my heart. I lifted my eyes skywards, but there was no peace even in the sky. Studded with stars, it seemed all moving, quivering, twinkling. I bent over to the river, but even there, even in those cold dark depths, the stars were trembling and glimmering. I seemed to feel an exciting quickening of life on all sides, and a sense of alarm rose up within me too. I leaned my elbows on the boat's edge. The whispering of the wind in my ears, the soft gurgling of the water at the rudder, worked on my nerves, and the fresh breath of the river did not cool me. A nightingale was singing on the bank, and stung me with the sweet poison of its notes. Tears rose into my eyes, but they were not the tears of aimless rapture. What I was feeling was not the vague sense I had known of late, of all-embracing desire when the soul expands, resounds, when it feels that it grasps all, loves all. No, it was the thirst for happiness aflame in me. I did not dare yet to call it by its name, but happiness, happiness full and overflowing, that was what I wanted, that was what I pined for. The boat floated on, and the old ferryman sat dozing as he leant on his oars. End of section 23section 24 of a lear of the steps etc by ivan turgenev this librivox recording is in the public domain Asia, part 11 as i set off next day to the gagins i did not ask myself whether i was in love with Asia, but i thought a great deal about her her fate absorbed me i rejoiced at our unexpected intimacy i felt that it was only yesterday i had got to know her till then she had turned away from me and now when she had at last revealed herself to me in what a seductive light her image showed itself how fresh it was for me what secret fascinations were modestly peeping out i walked boldly up the familiar road gazing continually at the cottage a white spot in the distance i thought not of the future not even of the morrow i was very happy Asia flushed directly I came into the room, 
I noticed that she had dressed herself in her best again, but the expression of her face was not in keeping with her finery. It was mournful, and I had come in such high spirits. I even fancied that she was on the point of running away as usual, but she controlled herself and remained. Gagin was in that peculiar condition of artistic heat and intensity which seizes amateurs all of a sudden, like a fit, when they imagine they are succeeding in catching nature and pinning her down. He was standing with dishevelled locks and besmeared with paint before a stretched canvas and flourishing the brush over it. He almost savagely nodded to me, turned away, screwed up his eyes, and bent again over his picture. I did not hinder him, but went and sat down by Asya. Slowly her dark eyes turned to me. "'You're not the same today as yesterday,' I observed, after ineffectual efforts to call up a smile on her lips. "'No, I'm not,' she answered, in a slow and dull voice. "'But that means nothing. I did not sleep well. I was thinking all night.' "'What about?' "'Oh, I thought about so many things. It's a way I have had from childhood, ever since I used to live with mother.' She uttered the word with an effort, and then repeated again. "'When I used to live with mother, I used to think why it was no one could tell what would happen to her. And sometimes one sees trouble coming, and one can't escape, and how it is one can never tell all the truth. Then I used to think I knew nothing, and that I ought to learn. I want to be educated over again. I am very badly educated. I can't play the piano. I can't draw, and even sewing I do very badly. I have no talent for anything. I must be a very dull person to be with." "'You're unjust to yourself,' I replied. "'You've read a lot, you're cultivated, and with your cleverness—' "'Why, am I clever?' she asked, with such naive interest that I could not help laughing, but she did not even smile. "'Brother, am I clever?' she asked Gagin. He made her no answer, but went on working, continually changing brushes and raising his arm. "'I don't know myself what is in my head,' Asya continued, with the same dreamy air. "'I am sometimes afraid of myself, really. Ah, I should like—' Is it true that women ought not to read a great deal?' "'A great deal's not wanted, but—' "'Tell me what I ought to read. Tell me what I ought to do. I will do everything you tell me,' she added, turning to me with innocent confidence. I could not at once find a reply. "'You won't be dull with me, though.' "'What nonsense!' I was beginning. "'All right, thanks,' Asya put in. "'I was thinking you would be bored.' And her little hot hand clasped mine warmly. "'N!' Gagin cried at that instant. Isn't that background too dark? I went up to him. Asya got up and went away. Part Twelve. She came back in an hour, stood in the doorway, and beckoned to me. Listen, she said, if I were to die, would you be sorry? What ideas you have today! I exclaimed. I fancy I shall die soon. It seems to me sometimes as though everything about me were saying good-bye. It's better to die than live like this. Ah! Don't look at me like that. I'm not pretending, really. Or else I shall begin to be afraid of you again." Why, were you afraid of me? If I am queer, it's really not my fault, she rejoined. You see, I can't even laugh now. She remained gloomy and preoccupied till evening. Something was taking place in her. What, I did not understand. Her eyes often rested upon me. My heart slowly throbbed under her enigmatic gaze. She appeared composed, and yet, as I watched her, I kept wanting to tell her not to let herself get excited. I admired her, found a touching charm in her pale face, her hesitating, slow movements, but for some reason she fancied I was out of humour. "'Let me tell you something,' she said to me not long before parting. I am tortured by the idea that you consider me frivolous. For the future, believe what I say to you, only do you, too, be open with me, and I will always tell you the truth. I give you my word of honour." This word of honour set me laughing again. "'Oh, don't laugh,' 
she said earnestly, or I shall say to you to-day what you said to me yesterday. Why are you laughing? And after a brief silence she added, Do you remember you spoke yesterday of wings? My wings have grown, but I have nowhere to fly. Nonsense, I said. All the ways lie open before you. Acia looked at me steadily, straight in the face. You have a bad opinion of me to-day, she said, frowning. I? a bad opinion of you why is it you are both so low-spirited gagin interrupted me would you like me to play a waltz as i did yesterday no no replied acia and she clenched her hands not to-day not for anything i'm not going to force you to don't excite yourself not for anything she repeated turning pale can it be she's in love with me i thought as I drew near the dark, rushing waters of the Rhine. End of section 24 Section 25 of A Lear of the Steps, etc., by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Asia, Part 13 Can it be that she loves me? I asked myself next morning, directly I awoke. I did not want to look into myself. I felt that her image, the image of the girl with the affected laugh, had crept close into my heart, and that I should not easily get rid of it. I went to L, and stayed there the whole day, but I saw Asia only by glimpses. She was not well. She had a headache. She came downstairs for a minute with a bandage round her forehead, looked white and thin, her eyes half-closed. With a faint smile she said, "'It will soon be over. It's nothing. Everything's soon over, isn't it?' and went away. I felt bored and, as it were, listlessly sad, yet I could not make up my mind to go for a long while, and went home late, without seeing her again. The next morning passed in a sort of half-slumber of the consciousness. I tried to set to work and could not. I tried to do nothing and not to think, and that was a failure too. I strolled about the town, returned home, went out again. "'Are you Herr N?' I heard a childish voice ask suddenly behind me. I looked round. A little boy was standing before me. "'This is for you from Fräulein Annette,' he said, handing me a note. I opened it, and recognized the irregular, rapid handwriting of Asia. "'I must see you to-day,' she wrote to me. "'Come to-day at four o'clock to the stone chapel on the road near the ruin. I have done a most foolish thing to-day. Come, for God's sake. You shall know all about it. Tell the messenger, yes.' "'Is there an answer?' the boy asked me. "'Say yes,' I replied. The boy ran off. Part fourteen. I went home to my own room, sat down, and sank into thought. My heart was beating violently. I read Asia's note through several times. I looked at my watch. It was not yet twelve o'clock. The door opened. Gagin walked in. His face was overcast. He seized my hand and pressed it warmly. He seemed very much agitated. "'What is the matter?' I asked. Gagin took a chair and sat down opposite me. Three days ago, he began with a rather forced smile, and hesitating, I surprised you by what I told you. Today I am going to surprise you more. With any other man I could not, most likely, bring myself so directly. But you're an honourable man. You're my friend, aren't you? Listen, my sister, Asia, is in love with you. I trembled all over and stood up. "'Your sister, you say?' "'Yes, yes,' Gagin cut me short. "'I tell you she's mad, and she'll drive me mad. But happily she can't tell a lie, and she confides in me. Ah, what a soul there is in that little girl! But she'll be her own ruin, that's certain.' "'But you're making a mistake,' I began. "'No, I'm not making a mistake.' Yesterday, you know, she was lying down almost all day. She ate nothing, but she did not complain. She never does complain. I was not anxious, though towards evening she was in a slight fever. At two o'clock last night I was awakened by our landlady. 
"'Go to your sister,' she said. "'There's something wrong with her.' I ran in to Asya and found her not undressed, feverish, and in tears. Her head was aching, her teeth were chattering. "'What's the matter with you?' I said. "'Are you ill?' She threw herself on my neck and began imploring me to take her away as soon as possible if I want to keep her alive. I could make out nothing. I tried to soothe her. Her sobs grew violent. And suddenly through her sobs I made out. Well, in fact, I made out that she loves you. I assure you, you and I are reasonable people, and we can't imagine how deeply she feels and with what incredible force her feelings show themselves. It has come upon her as unexpectedly and irresistibly as a thunderstorm. You're a very nice person, Gagin pursued, but why she's so in love with you, I confess, I don't understand. She says she has been drawn to you from the first moment she saw you. That's why she cried the other day when she declared she would never love any one but me. She imagines you despise her, that you most likely know about her birth. She asked me if I hadn't told you her story. I said, of course, that I hadn't. But her intuition's simply terrible. She has one wish, to get away, to get away at once. I sat with her till morning. She made me promise we should not be here to-morrow, and only then she fell asleep. I have been thinking and thinking, and at last I made up my mind to speak to you. To my mind, Asya is right. The best thing is for us both to go away from here. And I should have taken her away to-day, if I had not been struck by an idea which made me pause. Perhaps, who knows? Do you like my sister? If so, what's the object of my taking her away? And so I decided to cast away all reserve. Besides, I noticed something myself. I made up my mind to find out from you. Poor Gagin was completely out of countenance. Excuse me, please, he added. I'm not used to such bothers. I took his hand. You want to know, I pronounced in a steady voice, whether I like your sister? Yes, I do like her. Gagin glanced at me. But, he said, faltering, you'd hardly marry her, would you? How would you have me answer such a question? Only think, can I at the moment? I know, I know, Gagin cut me short. I have no right to expect an answer from you, and my question was the very acme of impropriety. But what am I to do? One can't play with fire. You don't know Asya. She's quite capable of falling ill, running away, or asking you to see her alone. Any other girl might manage to hide it all and wait, but not she. It is the first time with her, that's the worst of it. If you had seen how she sobbed at my feet to-day, you would understand my fears." I was pondering. Gagin's words, asking you to see her alone, had sent a twinge to my heart. I felt it was shameful not to meet his honest frankness with frankness. Yes, I said at last, you are right. An hour ago I got a note from your sister. Here it is. Gagin took the note, quickly looked it through, and let his hands fall on his knees. The expression of perplexity on his face was very amusing, but I was in no mood for laughter. "'I tell you again, you're an honourable man,' he said. "'But what's to be done now? What? She herself wants to go away, and she writes to you and blames herself for acting unwisely. And when had she time to write this? What does she wish of you?' I pacified him, and we began to discuss as coolly as we could what we ought to do. The conclusion we reached at last was that, to avoid worse harm befalling, I was to go and meet Asya, and to have a straightforward explanation with her. Gagin pledged himself to stay at home, and not to give a sign of knowing about her note to me. In the evening we arranged to see each other again. "'I have the greatest confidence in you,' said Gagin and he pressed my hand. Have mercy on her and on me, but we shall go away to-morrow anyway," he added, getting up, for you won't marry Asya, I see. Give me time till the evening, I objected. All right, but you won't marry her. He went away, and I threw myself on the sofa and shut my eyes. My head was going round, too many impressions had come bursting on it at once. I was vexed at Gagin's frankness, 
I was vexed with Asia, her love delighted and disconcerted me, I could not comprehend what had made her reveal it to her brother. The absolute necessity of rapid, almost instantaneous decision exasperated me. Marry a little girl of seventeen, with her character. How is it possible? I said, getting up. End of section 25section twenty six of a lear of the steps etc by ivan turgenev this librivox recording is in the public domain asia part fifteen at the appointed hour i crossed the rhine and the first person i met on the opposite bank was the very boy who had come to me in the morning he was obviously waiting for me from frulein annette he said in a whisper and he handed me another note Asia informed me she had changed the place of our meeting. I was to go in an hour and a half, not to the chapel, but to Frau Luise's house, to knock below and go up to the third story. "'Is it yes again?' asked the boy. "'Yes,' I repeated, and I walked along the bank of the Rhine. There was not time to go home, I didn't want to wander about the streets. Beyond the town hall there was a little garden, with a skittle ground and tables for beer drinkers. I went in there. A few middle-aged Germans were playing skittles. The wooden balls rolled along with a sound of knocking, now and then cries of approval reached me. A pretty waitress, with her eyes swollen and weeping, brought me a tankard of beer. I glanced at her face. She turned quickly and walked away. "'Yes, yes!' observed a fat red-cheeked citizen sitting by our hanschen is dreadfully upset to-day her sweetheart's gone for a soldier i looked at her she was sitting huddled up in a corner her face propped on her hand tears were rolling one by one between her fingers some one called for beer she took him a pot and went back to her place her grief affected me i began musing on the interview awaiting me but my dreams were anxious, cheerless dreams. It was with no light heart I was going to this interview. I had no prospect before me of giving myself up to the bliss of love returned. What lay before me was to keep my word, to do a difficult duty. One can't play with her. These words of Gagin's had gone through my heart like arrows. And three days ago, in that boat borne along by the current, had I not been pining with the thirst for happiness? It had become possible, and I was hesitating. I was pushing it away. I was bound to push it from me. Its suddenness bewildered me. Asia herself, with her fiery temperament, her past, her bringing up, this fascinating, strange creature, I confess, she frightened me. My feelings were long struggling within me. The appointed hour was drawing near. I can't marry her, I decided at last. She shall not know I love her. I got up, and putting a thaler in the hand of poor Hanschen, she did not even thank me, I directed my steps towards Frau Luise's. The air was already overcast with the shadows of evening, and the narrow strip of sky, above the dark street, was red with the glow of sunset. I knocked faintly at the door. It was opened at once. I stepped through the doorway, and found myself in complete darkness. "'This way,' I heard an old woman's voice. "'You're expected.' I took two steps, groping my way. A long hand took mine. "'Is that you, Frau Louise? I asked. "'Yes,' answered the same voice. "'Tis I, my fine young man.' The old woman led me up a steep staircase, and stopped on the third floor. In the feeble light from a tiny window, I saw the wrinkled visage of the burgomaster's widow. A crafty smile of mawkish sweetness contorted her sunken lips, and pursed up her dim-sighted eyes. She pointed me to a little door. With an abrupt movement I opened it and slammed it behind me. Part 16 In the little room into which I stepped, it was rather dark, and I did not at once see Asia. 
Wrapped in a big shawl, she was sitting on a chair by the window, turning away from me, and almost hiding her head like a frightened bird. She was breathing quickly, and trembling all over. I felt unutterably sorry for her. I went up to her. She averted her head still more. "'Anna Nikolaevna,' I said. She suddenly drew herself up, tried to look at me, and could not. I took her hand. It was cold, and lay like a dead thing in mine. "'I wished,' Asya began, trying to smile, but unable to control her pale lips. "'I wanted. No, I can't,' she said, and ceased. Her voice broke at every word. I sat down beside her. "'Anna Nikolaevna,' I repeated, and I too could say nothing more. A silence followed. I still held her hand and looked at her. She sat as before, shrinking together, breathing with difficulty, and stealthily biting her lower lip to keep back the rising tears. I looked at her. There was something touchingly helpless in her timid passivity. It seemed as though she had been so exhausted she had hardly reached the chair, and had simply fallen on it. My heart began to melt. Asya. I said hardly audibly. She slowly lifted her eyes to me. Oh, the eyes of a woman who loves! Who can describe them? They were supplicating, those eyes. They were confiding, questioning, surrendering. I could not resist their fascination. A subtle flame passed all through me with tingling shocks. I bent down and pressed my lips to her hand. I heard a quivering sound, like a broken sigh, and I felt on my hair the touch of a feeble hand shaking like a leaf. I raised my head and looked at her face. How transformed it was all of a sudden! The expression of terror had vanished from it. Her eyes looked far away and drew me after them. Her lips were slightly parted, her forehead was white as marble, and her curls floated back as though the wind had stirred them. I forgot everything. I drew her to me, her hand yielded unresistingly, her whole body followed her hand, the shawl fell from her shoulders, and her head lay softly on my breast, lay under my burning lips. "'Yours,' she murmured, hardly above a breath. My arms were slipping round her waist, but suddenly the thought of Gagin flashed like lightning before me. "'What are we doing?' I cried, abruptly moving back. Your brother, why, he knows everything. He knows I am with you." Asya sank back on her chair. Yes, I went on, getting up and walking to the other end of the room. Your brother knows all about it. I had to tell him. You had to? she articulated thickly. She could not, it seemed, recover herself, and hardly understood me. Yes, yes. I repeated with a sort of exasperation, and it's all your fault, your fault. What did you betray your secret for? Who forced you to tell your brother? He has been with me to-day, and told me what you said to him. I tried not to look at Asya, and kept walking with long strides up and down the room. Now everything is over, everything. Asya tried to get up from her chair. Stay, I cried, stay, I implore you. You have to do with an honourable man, yes, an honourable man. But in heaven's name what upset you? Did you notice any change in me? But I could not hide my feelings from your brother when he came to me to-day. Why am I talking like this? I was thinking inwardly, and the idea that I was an immoral liar, that Gagin knew of our interview, that everything was spoiled, exposed, seemed buzzing persistently in my head. "'I didn't call my brother,' I heard a frightened whisper from Asya. "'He came of himself.' "'See what you have done,' I persisted. "'Now you want to go away.' "'Yes, I must go away,' she murmured, in the same soft voice. "'I only asked you to come here to say good-bye.' "'And do you suppose,' I retorted, "'it will be easy for me to part with you?' "'But what did you tell my brother for?' Asya said, in perplexity. "'I tell you, I could not do otherwise. If you had not yourself betrayed yourself—' 
i locked myself in my room she answered simply i did not know the landlady had another key this innocent apology on her lips at such a moment almost infuriated me at the time and now i cannot think of it without emotion poor honest truthful child and now everything's at an end i began again everything now we shall have to part i stole a look at Asya. her face had quickly flushed crimson she was i felt it both ashamed and afraid i went on walking and talking as though in delirium you did not let the feeling develop which had begun to grow you have broken off our relations yourself you had no confidence in me you doubted me while i was talking Asya bent more and more forward and suddenly slid on her knees dropped her head on her arms and began sobbing i ran up to her and tried to lift her up but she would not let me i can't bear women's tears at the sight of them i am at my wits end at once anna nikolaevna Asya, i kept repeating please i implore you for god's sake stop i took her hand again but to my immense astonishment she suddenly jumped up rushed with lightning swiftness to the door and vanished when a few minutes later frau luis came into the room i was still standing in the very middle of it as it were thunderstruck i could not believe this interview could possibly have come to such a quick such a stupid end when i had not said a hundredth part of what i wanted to say and what i ought to have said when i did not know myself in what way it would be concluded is fraulein gone frau louise asked me raising her yellow eyebrows right up to her false front i stared at her like a fool and went away End of section 26section 27 of a lear of the steps etc by ivan turgenev this librivox recording is in the public domain arsia part 17 i made my way out of the town and struck out straight into the open country i was devoured by anger frenzied anger i hurled reproaches at myself how was it i had not seen the reason that had forced Asya to change the place of our meeting how was it i did not appreciate what it must have cost her to go to that old woman how was it i had not kept her alone with her in that dim half-dark room i had had the force i had had the heart to repulse her even to reproach her now her image simply pursued me i begged her forgiveness the thought of that pale face those wet and timid eyes of her loose hair falling on the drooping neck the light touch of her head against my breast maddened me yours i heard her whisper i acted from conscientious motives i assured myself not true did i really desire such a termination was i capable of parting from her could i really do without her madman madman i repeated with exasperation meanwhile night was coming on I walked with long strides towards the house where Asya lived. Part 18 Gagin came out to meet me. "'Have you seen my sister?' he shouted to me, while I was still some distance off. "'Why, isn't she at home?' I asked. "'No. She hasn't come back?' "'No. I was in fault,' Gagin went on. "'I couldn't restrain myself. Contrary to our agreement, I went to the chapel. She was not there. Didn't she come, then? She hasn't been at the chapel. And you haven't seen her? I was obliged to admit I had seen her. Where? At Frau Luise's. I parted from her an hour ago, I added. I felt sure she had come home. We will wait a little, said Gagin. We went into the house and sat down near each other. We were silent. We both felt very uncomfortable. We were continually looking round, staring at the door, listening. At last Gagin got up. "'Oh, this is beyond anything!' he cried. "'My heart's in my mouth. She'll be the death of me, by God. Let's go and look for her.' We went out. It was quite dark by now outside. 
"'What did you talk about to her?' Gagin asked me, as he pulled his hat over his eyes. "'I only saw her for five minutes,' I answered. "'I talked to her as we agreed.' "'Do you know what?' he replied. "'It's better for us to separate. In that way we're more likely to come across her before long. In any case, come back here within an hour.' Part 19 I went hurriedly down from the vineyard and rushed into the town. I walked rapidly through all the streets, looked in all directions, even at Frau Luise's windows, went back to the Rhine, and ran along the bank. From time to time I was met by women's figures, but Asia was nowhere to be seen. There was no anger gnawing at my heart now. I was tortured by a secret terror, and it was not only terror that I felt. No, I felt remorse the most intense regret, and love, yes, the tenderest love. I wrung my hands. I called, Asia through the falling darkness of the night, first in a low voice, then louder and louder. I repeated a hundred times over that I loved her. I vowed I would never part from her. I would have given everything in the world to hold her cold hand again, to hear again her soft voice, to see her again before me she had been so near, she had come to me, her mind perfectly made up, in perfect innocence of heart and feelings, she had offered me her unsullied youth, and I had not folded her to my breast, I had robbed myself of the bliss of watching her sweet face blossom with delight and the peace of rapture, this thought drove me out of my mind. "'Where can she have gone? What can she have done with herself?' I cried in an agony of helpless despair. I caught a glimpse of something white on the very edge of the river. I knew the place. There stood there, over the tomb of a man who had been drowned seventy years ago, a stone cross half buried in the ground, bearing an old inscription. My heart sank. I ran up to the cross. The white figure vanished. I shouted, Asia! I felt frightened myself by my uncanny voice. But no one called back. I resolved to go and see whether Gagin had found her. Part 20 As I climbed swiftly up the vineyard path, I caught sight of a light in Asia's room. This reassured me a little. I went up to the house. The door below was fastened. I knocked. A window on the ground floor was cautiously opened, and Gagin's head appeared. "'Have you found her?' I asked. "'She has come back.' he answered in a whisper. She is in her own room, undressing. Everything is all right. "'Thank God!' I cried, in an indescribable rush of joy. "'Thank God! Now everything is right. But you know we must have another talk.' "'Another time,' he replied, softly drawing the casement towards him. "'Another time. But now, good-bye.' "'Till to-morrow,' I said. "'To-morrow everything shall be arranged.' "'Good-bye,' repeated Gagin. The window was closed. I was on the point of knocking at the window. I was on the point of telling Gagin there and then that I wanted to ask him for his sister's hand. But such a proposal at such a time! "'Tomorrow,' I reflected. "'Tomorrow I shall be happy.' "'Tomorrow I shall be happy. Happiness has no tomorrow, no yesterday. It thinks not on the past, and dreams not of the future. It has the present. Not a day even, a moment. I don't remember how I got to Z. It was not my legs that carried me, nor a boat that ferried me across. I felt that I was borne along by great mighty wings. I passed a bush where a nightingale was singing. I stopped and listened long. I fancied it sang my love and happiness. End of section 27 Section 28 of A Lear of the Steps, etc. by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Asia, Part 21 When, next morning, I began to approach the little house I knew so well, I was struck with one circumstance. All the windows in it were open, and the door too stood open. Some bits of paper were lying about in front of the doorway. A maid-servant appeared with a broom at the door. I went up to her. 
they are gone she bawled before i had time to inquire whether gagin was at home gone i repeated what do you mean by gone where they went away this morning at six o'clock and didn't say where wait a minute i believe you're mr n aren't you i'm mr n yes the mistress has a letter for you the maid went upstairs and returned with a letter here it is if you please sir but it's impossible how can it be i was beginning the servant stared blankly at me and began sweeping i opened the letter gagin had written it there was not one word from Asia. he began with begging me not to be angry at his sudden departure he felt sure that on mature consideration i should approve of his decision he could find no other way out of a position which might become difficult and dangerous yesterday evening he wrote while we were both waiting in silence for Asia, i realized conclusively the necessity of separation there are prejudices i respect i can understand that it's impossible for you to marry Asia. she has told me everything for the sake of her peace of mind i was bound to yield to her reiterated urgent entreaties at the end of the letter he expressed his regret that our acquaintance had come to such a speedy termination wished me every happiness shook my hand in friendship and besought me not to try to seek them out what prejudices i cried aloud as though he could hear me what rubbish what right has he to snatch her from me i clutched at my head the servant began loudly calling for her mistress her alarm forced me to control myself one idea was a flame within me to find them to find them wherever they might be to accept this blow to resign myself to such a calamity was impossible i learnt from the landlady that they had got on to a steamer at six o'clock in the morning and were going down the rhine i went to the ticket office there i was told they had taken tickets for cologne i was going home to pack up at once and follow them i happened to pass the house of frau louise suddenly i heard someone calling me i raised my head and at the window of the room where i had met Asia the day before i saw the burgomaster's widow she smiled her loathsome smile and called me i turned away and was going on but she called after me that she had something for me these words brought me to a halt and i went into her house how can i describe my feelings when i saw that room again by rights began the old woman showing me a little note i oughtn't to have given you this unless you'd come to me of your own accord but you are such a fine young man take it i took the note on a tiny scrap of paper stood the following words hurriedly scribbled in pencil good-bye we shall not see each other again it is not through pride that i'm going away no i can't help it yesterday when i was crying before you if you had said one word to me only one word i should have stayed you did not say it it seems it is better so good-bye for ever one word oh madman that i was that word i had repeated it the night before with tears i had flung it to the wind i had said it over and over again among the empty fields but i did not say it to her i did not tell her i loved her indeed i could not have uttered that word then when i met her in that fatal room i had as yet no clear consciousness of my love it had not fully awakened even when i was sitting with her brother in senseless and burdensome silence it flamed up with irrepressible force only a few instants later when terrified by the possibility of misfortune i began to seek and call her but then it was already too late but that's impossible i shall be told i don't know whether it's possible i know that it's the truth Asia would not have gone away if there had been the faintest shade of coquetry in her and if her position had not been a false one she could not put up with what any other girl would have endured i did not realize that my evil genius had arrested an avowal on my lips at my last interview with gagin at the darkened window and the last thread i might have caught at had slipped out of my fingers 
The same day I went back with my portmanteau, packed, to L, and started for Cologne. I remember the steamer was already off, and I was taking a mental farewell of those streets, all those spots which I was never to forget, when I caught sight of Hanshin. She was sitting on a seat near the river. Her face was pale, but not sad. A handsome young fellow was standing beside her, laughing and telling her some story. While on the other side of the Rhine, my little Madonna peeped out of the green of the old ash-tree as mournfully as ever. Part 22 In Cologne I came upon traces of the Gagans. I found out they had gone to London. I pushed on in pursuit of them, but in London all my researches were in vain. It was long before I would resign myself, for a long while I persevered, but I was obliged at last to give up all hope of coming across them. And I never saw them again. I never saw Asia. Vague rumours reached me about him, but she had vanished for ever for me. I don't even know whether she is alive. One day, a few years later, in a railway carriage abroad, I caught a glimpse of a woman whose face vividly recalled those features I could never forget, but I was most likely deceived by a chance resemblance. Asia remained in my memory a little girl such as I had known her at the best time of my life, as I saw her the last time leaning against the back of a low wooden chair. But I must own I did not grieve over long for her. I even came to the conclusion that fate had done all for the best in not uniting me to Asia. I consoled myself with the reflection that I should probably not have been happy with such a wife. I was young then, and the future, the brief, swiftly passing future, seemed boundless to me then. Could not what have been be repeated, I thought, and better, fairer still? I got to know other women, but the feeling Asia had aroused in me, that intense, tender, deep feeling, has never come again. No, no eyes have for me taken the place of those that were once turned with love upon my eyes, to no heart, pressed to my breast, has my heart responded with such joyous, sweet emotion. Condemned as I have been to a solitary life, without ties or family, I have led a dreary existence, but I keep as sacred relics her little notes and the dry geranium, the flower she threw me once out of the window, it still retains a faint scent, while the hand that gave it, the hand I only once pressed to my lips, has perhaps long since decayed in the grave. And I, myself, what has become of me? What is left of me, of those blissful, heart-stirring days, of those winged hopes and aspirations? The faint fragrance of an insignificant plant outlives all man's joys and sorrows. Outlives man himself. End of section 28. End of Asia. End of A Lear of the Steps, etc. by Ivan Turgenev. Translated by Constance Garnett. Recording by Lee Smalley.